Hi guys, Alicia from Morning Hawk Creations. Today's quick tutorial is spring inspired. With all those Easter bunnies bouncing about, I went back to watch one of my favorite books that was later produced into a movie, Watership Down by Richard Adams. After digging through some old files, I finally found the perfect rabbit for whom, when I first saw him, completely reminded me of a secondary character in the book named Silver. For today's episode, I'll be working in the Derwent's Inktense pencils. This piece it is 9 by 12 and is completed on Strathmore vellum paper. This will be a quick study rather than a finished piece. While I start off as normal with the pencils right to the paper, my concern was that the ink straight from the pencil would be too strong for the entire piece. In an effort to soften the media, I am wetting the ink in the pencil with a brush, wet with clean water, then transferring the now liquid pigment to a clean 10-well palette with just water. With only half of the palette wet and clean and dry areas available, I can not only thin the ink down to variations of gray, but I can also get a much more precise line using the Master's Touch 10-0 spotter and a 20-0 liner. Using this method gave me much more control of how much pigment gets applied to the paper and where it gets distributed. Thinned or straight, used on dry paper, the line is strong with sharp edges defining the pigment. Remember our first rule, more contrast is where your eye is drawn to a piece, so naturally I want to keep a lot of pop in the area surrounding the eye and in the face. But as I get farther and farther away from the face and the eye, I will wet the paper prior to applying the pigment. This causes the ink to bleed and seep around the paper, creating a softer, more blended edge. The importance for this technique gets back to our second rule about contrast. The more contrast, the harder the edges, and the coarser the texture may appear. The less contrast, the softer and smoother the subject will appear to be. Since rabbits are so legendarily soft, we have to convey that in the texture of the fur. So contrast and disciplined use of contrast is exceptionally important. One thing I do want to mention before I move on is a few notes about rabbit anatomy. I have noticed missing in many other rabbit tutorials information requ required on anatomy concerning those eyes. Rabbits have round pupils. That is not just a glassy black marble in their skull. Eyes come in a variety of colors blue, dark brown, light brown, gray blue, ruby, bright red, and marbled. That is just as it sounds. It's when the iris has two or more distinct colors, that term is called marbled. Amber eyes are reserved for wild rabbits and hares. As a rabbit ages, the eyes darken with increased production of melanin. One of the interesting traits that you share with a rabbit is that both species are born with underdeveloped amounts of melanin in their eyes, which is why some human babies who are born with blue eyes turn brown later in life. Rabbit with pink or ruby eyes feature traits of albinism, a complete lack of pigment in the skin and the iris. Rabbits, like many other mammals, have two different hairs that make up their coat, undercoat and guard hairs. Guard hairs are the ones that people generally associate with the colors or markings of a given rabbit. Wild rabbits are considered to have a goody coloring, which is having three to five colored bands on the individual hair shafts. Domestic rabbits have hundreds of different variations of colors, patterns, and coat combination, thus ensuring that no two rabbits, unless they're albino, look exactly alike. Now about silver. This is a picture of silver from 1978 version, movie version of Watership Down. 
While the book is hailed as a literary success, the movie took a much harder critical judgment in the box office because its candor about the violent themes and lives that wild rabbits endure, and it was not tamed down in its animated version. One of my very favorite features about the book is that Adam spent time creating a whole language for the rabbits to speak. Called lepine, its foreign-sounding words are quickly narrated through in the movie, and the book contains glossary and footnotes for those interested in a quick reference. Since most animated movies and specials were geared toward children at the time, it was inadvertently taken as a children's film, causing parrots and critics much debate to this day about whether or not it's child-appropriate. Graphic scenes spatter throughout the movie that can both be sudden and slow in coming, much like a villain in any good box office thriller. The plot is about a group of rabbits who choose to leave their home under the belief that there is a great danger coming and they will die if they stay. Silver is an Ausla officer who chooses to leave the warren with the other rabbits. In the movie, Silver makes a few small appearances and in the series is completely left out. I didn't mention that series, did I? Nope. I'm not a fan. It pretty much takes the book and chops it up, sticks it in a blender, and then pours it all over your book, reading, movie, enjoying face. The animation is mediocre at best and is most disappointing in its softening of the main character's features and the nerfing of the plot. I'm not a fan. I don't like it. In the book, Silver is described a hefty, brisk-looking rabbit, sometime, something over 12 months old. He was well known by sight to all the warm for his fur was entirely gray with patches of near white. This was Silver, nephew of Thera, who was serving his first month in the Ausla, a quiet, straightforward fellow who had not yet found his feet among the veterans. Silver is picked on for his silver coat, with many thinking the only reason he had a place in the Ausla was because his uncle was the chief rabbit. Once Hazel, Fiverr, Bigwig, and the others leave Sandalfoot Warren, Silver joins Bigwig as an impromptu Ausla officer. The Ausla are described as strong or clever rabbits that defend and enforce the authority of the chief rabbit. Silver stays mostly on the sidelines until they come upon the Warren of the Shining Wire. The history of this dismal place is darker than it first appears. Flera, or vegetables, are put out every night by the farmer. The farmer also kills the fox, weasels, and badgers that come near the warren, endangering the rabbits. However, Cowslip, the group's leader, downplays the need for stories and tricks, something wild rabbits used to amuse themselves and, situ and help in situations where they would think their way out. Also, Cowslip evades questions about other rabbits, as well as many other questions about really anything at all. But the burrows are dry, the food is plentiful, and the dangers seem to be non-existent. But after Big Wig is caught in a snare, Silver is the one who suggests that they run the other rabbits out and take the warren for themselves. Fiverr points out that the warren is a death trap. The rabbits in there are fed by the farmer and snared. If they should be too clever for the snares, surely the white death would come to the warren. Fiverr then tells a story of how a warren had been poisoned by a farmer. When the warren came back, he fed the rabbits, keeping them safe and healthy and fattening them up. The rabbits grew dull and lazy. They chose to lie to themselves and to forget the ways of wild rabbits. In the warren, there was but one rule. No one must ask where another rabbit is. And to speak of the wires was intolerable. This easy life came at a terrible cost, which quickly quieted the notion of driving out Cowslip and his warren. The group then decides to continue moving on when they are approached by Strawberry, a rabbit from the Warren of the Shining Wires. Strawberry asks to leave with them, and Silver replies, We don't care for creatures who deceive us. While Silver is given a supporting role to other main characters such as Bigwig, Hazel, Dandelion, and Fiverr, he is, as he is described in the book, very straightforward, making him a reliable character whose actions and intents are never in question when other, more pressing concerns come about. Okay, so I did forget to mention that I did go in with the fan brush in the backside and the rump of silver. That was a little bad on me, but you kind of got the gist of what I was doing, which is basically just a larger version of what I was doing with the 10-0 and the 20-0. 
And this pretty much is going to sum it up. We're going to finish off Silver's Feet right here. And then we're going to head out. If you enjoyed this, definitely give me a thumbs up. I did incorporate quite a few bit of upgrades on this one, including a new audio editor. So if you want to give me any more feedback on it or you got any suggestions, let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks a lot, guys.